Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Rahul Merotra, Chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design. I want to begin by acknowledging that the Harvard Graduate School of Design is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past, present, and future, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. The school also recognizes the work of the Harvard University Native American program in cultivating the relationships that led to the creation of this acknowledgement. Before we jump into today's events, a quick reminder that we have a live captioning available for our virtual audience. Uh, to enable captions, click the closed captioning button at the bottom of the live stream window. I also want to invite you to join us for an upcoming GST program this Thursday, February 16th at 6.30, to join us for the annual Sylvester Baxter, Baxter Lecture, which will be delivered by Kofi Boone. And now, welcome for tonight's event, the second Jacqueline Tirrett Urban Design Lecture, honoring the legacy of groundbreaking GST professor Jacqueline Tirrett, who worked to establish and fortify the urban design program during its founding years. The Jacqueline Tirrett Lectureship was previously named the 50th anniversary of the Urban Design Program Lecture, and this fund was created in 2010 to celebrate the first formal North American program in urban design's 50th milestone year. The, graduate, the GSD is grateful to Alex Krieger, Moshe Safti, Jay Chatterjee, and Lee Cott, who led the charge in fundraising for this lectureship. These four, along with countless others, helped endow the lectureship as an enduring part of the school's public program, bringing world-class practitioners in urban design to engage with the school through lectures and symposia. The GSD renamed the 50th anniversary of the Urban Design Program Lecture for Professor Jacqueline Tirrett, who served as an associate professor at the GSD between 1955 and 69. Jacqueline Tirrett played a central role in 20th century design history and, as with, and was at the center of the group of people who shaped the post-war modern movement. But Tirrett also forged a highly influential synthesis between the bioregionalism of the pioneer Scottish planner Patrick Geddes and the tenets of European modernism. She, continued to the, uh, she contributed to the development of this set of ideas in diverse geographic, cultural, and institutional settings and through personal relationships that comprise transnational networks of scholars, practitioners, concerned with a humanistic ecological approach to urban and regional planning and design. Tirrett also played a critical role in creating new programs for planning education in England, North America, and Asia, pioneering methods for registered overlay, overlay mapping, a forerunner to GIS, and assisting the CIM president, Jose Luis Cert, establish a professional field of urban design based on this, this course at Harvard University 56-69. She was consultant to the United Nations, collaborated with, Sigrid, uh, with Gideon on all his major publications in English from 1947 on, and helped Doxiadis promote a holistic approach to the study of human settlements, which he termed echistics, as a founding editor of the journal Echistics and in the 10 Delos Symposium that Doxiadis hosted between 63 and 72. So in short, she was an incredible woman, opening up new directions for planning, education, and transnational networks, which were critical in shaping the profession as we know it today. I'm incredibly happy that we are celebrating her importance at the GSD, the Jacqueline Tirrett Urban Design Lecture, which will be delivered each year by a visionary urban planner, designer, scholar, or leader who has opened up novel directions in urban design thinking. And it's my great pleasure to now invite Dean Sarah Whiting to introduce our Jacqueline Tirrett Urban Design Lecturer for tonight, Adele Santos. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Happy Valentine's Day. I love you all. So in, in today's Google-driven world, I don't need to stand here and recite Adele Santos's long, long list of accomplishments, although I am curious to know just what part of Adele drew you here. Is it her remarkable 11-year run as dean down the street at MIT, during which time she brought greater visibility to all the school's departments? hiring and cultivating significant design talent while also better consolidating the many cons components of that school. And as a course four graduate, I thank you. 
Or are you here because you've heard stories about her tenure as chair of the Department of Architecture at UPenn, where she was famous for cooking up dinners, as well as a curriculum that brought together different voices who then went on to become lifelong friends and sometimes collaborators. Michael Rotundi once referred to her as a design matchmaker, noting that she was responsible for bringing Craig Hodgetts, Michael Sorkin, and Wolf Pricks together. Or is it her time in Houston teaching at Rice, where among other things, she co-directed the televised documentary series Invisible Cities with Rice Media Design Center, Rice Media Center founder James Blue. This five-part series done in 1979 was an early experiment in interactive media, focusing on the decay of Houston's housing stock and based on research done by Santos's Rice students. It featured interviews with developers, landlords, heads of city agencies, and the population living in, in the city's substandard housing. Audience members were invited to call in to influence the final episode. I think Netflix is looking to her now. This isn't an exhaustive list of Adele's academic episodes. I should note also, of course, that she was a member of our own GSD faculty, and she's a graduate of the MAUD program. But these few examples give some indication of her remarkable track record in landing in a school and transforming it. This propensity was recognized by the AIA and the ACSA, who awarded her the Topaz Medal in 2009. One of her letters of support noted that she has been like a force of nature in architectural education and practice, inevitable and irresistible. Happy Valentine's Day. But there's more. An entirely different Adele who could be what, what drew you here this evening, Adele the practitioner. She's a principal architect in the firm Santos Prescott and Associates based in San Francisco and Somerville. Her architectural and planning work includes affordable housing, the ICA building in Philadelphia, Yerba Buena Gardens Children's Center in San Francisco, a vision plan for San Diego among other projects. Her own homes in Somerville and Gloucester show her talent with form, space, materials, and siding. What, one might ask, holds all of these Adels together? I think it goes to her core belief that people need more, than the built, more from the built environment than accommodation of functional requirements. That sounds kind of easy, and I dare say it should be a baseline for any designer today. But in her choreo choreographing of conversations, of academic departments of school and schools, of buildings and of cities, she demonstrates how to foreground our experience as human beings in buildings and cities without becoming essentialist, nostalgic, or incoherent. As you'll hear, she's opinionated, engaged, driven, funny, and feisty. Most of all, She's always worked to advance design and design education, and for that I thank her and welcome her to the podium. Thank you, Adele. Wow, thank you both, that was terrific. Um, I was quite excited when Rahul called me up and uh, <clears throat> because I was a student of Jackie's, and that was a long time ago. And, um, let me see. Thank you. That's a very strange looking um, title and everything else, and I'll give you a quick run through why it's there. But um, this is a methodology that I actually started as a result of working with people at the, um, the AA in London and then with Jackie here at, at the GSD. And um, I hardly knew what I was doing at the time, to be absolutely honest, but I always was make, making these kinds of drawings. And that was part of me actually translating ideas into images that then could be changed into designs. Oh, thank you. Good. All right, thank you very much. Um, so um, I thought when I was asked to do this, I really have to start with Jackie. And Jackie was, wow, there was 62, 61, 62. So I went back in time and decided I was going to put together a talk uh, that, that referenced this. Because uh, for me, it was, it was really important. But before I get to that, uh, there are a couple of threads here which are kind of important. When Jackie actually joined the GSD, it was uh, 55, 1955. At that precise moment, I was graduating from high school and uh, going to a university. And what did I want to do? I wanted to be an architect. My dad and my mom said, an architect? Women? No. 
I said, well, too bad. They said, well, you know, there'll be no role models. I said, so? All right, there's nothing they could do about it. So in fact, I went to study architecture in Cape Town. The year one, there were three girls. Year two, two girls. Year three, 49 men and one girl, me. And uh, that's all fine, but I came top of the class. I was top of structures and design, and my dad said, oh my God, now you better go on. If you can get into the AA, I'll pay for you. It wasn't an easy exam, that's what I did. So I land up in London, honestly, at the AA, uh, which uh, Jackie had, by the way, in her career, we can get to that. And, um, and when I'm there, they basically, um, there were the Team 10 crowd there, you know. I didn't know that Jackie would know them, but she of course did, you know, she knew everybody. So um, she recommended, and everybody recommended that I actually go to the urban design program at Harvard. And so I'm primed to do this. So I arrived one day on the campus. I'd been in London, and I'd been in Paris. And I'm wearing a shiny green kind of coat which the street sweepers used to wear in, in Paris. And some guy stops me on the yard and says, oh, you can't, and I was wearing pants and boots. And he said, you, you can't see the dean looking like that. I went like, are you kidding me? There's dress code here. And then what was I gonna do about it? So I strode on, and then I come to, to the building, which is, I think it was called Robinson Hall. And it used to have very tall doors, 12 foot high. And Sirt, actually, was a very small man and he always wore a fedora, and what they'd cut was a hole that only he could go through without stooping. And I then, in my yellow raincoat and everything, I'm going to meet Jackie and suit himself, and you know, I, I have to stoop to get in there. I thought it was hilarious, by the way. I think this is not the beginning of what's gonna be a lot of fun. Sirt was charming, I loved him, he was great. Nobody even noticed that I had this yellow raincoat on. And there it was Jackie, this formidable woman who was actually going to be my mentor. Uh, uh, during a year that was coming up. Anyway, so that's really where it all began. And then I was, I was sitting down thinking, gosh, I don't know enough about Jackie. Here I am mentally in 62, 61. And uh, thank you, Rahul, for telling me a lot. So I actually go in and I start reading literature about Jackie. I was being very diligent here uh, because I really wanted to understand who, was this, who this woman really was. And what, what was her life? It was a little mysterious. So, so Jackie, Jackie is born to an upper class British family in 1905. And uh, her dad was an architect, and she was born in South Africa, as I was. And my dad was an architect, okay. And she, um, when it gets to the time of, of actually needing to do something else in life, she wanted to study and be an academic. Absolutely no way. She was really told that women of our ilk do not have careers at the stage in 1905. So she went to horticultural school, and she actually studied in one year uh, to be a gardener, to make gardens. And, um, and that never left her, by the way, because at the end of her life, she was still doing this. Um, but then in 24, 25, she decided to go to the AA in London. I didn't even know they taught garden design, but that's what she went for. And that's where she uh, discovered Patrick Geddes this brilliant man, this one-of-a-kind, extraordinary genius, and uh, he was already in his late 60s, and uh, he completely turned her life around, there's no doubt about it. And he'd written Cities and Evolution, it was in 1915. Um, he was very, very important. They called him the founding father of city planning. He was called all sorts of things. He was actually um, considered to be, let's see what they said he was, oh my God. <laughs> Uh, everything, everything. He, he, you know, he was a sociologist. He was a botanist. You know, he was, he was. It, it went on, it went on and on. And he actually had this enormous career in this capacity. He was seriously a one of a one of a kind. And then after that, um, she kind of kept close to him in life, and uh, went to spend time with them and the family. And this really was kind of marked a very important part of her career because what she learned from Geddes was what she carried with her everywhere. Um, in 1939, she went to the School of Planning and National Development uh, and gets another diploma. Uh, and so it goes on. And during the war years, she played all sorts of really important roles. She had a correspondence course for people in the front, uh, training them in potential to be town planners and people work in the reconstruction of, of, of London and so on. Um, somewhere along the line, she kind of met up with people in Siam. I mean, it was such an important discussion going on everywhere. 
Um, and I'm not quite sure where she, where she intersected with it, but she, she definitely did. And in 1951, she moves to Canada, where she actually does briefly have, have uh, worked. She worked in Toronto. She started to, to teach. And, um, and then she obviously, somewhere along the line, got to know Sigrid Gideon and Sert. Uh, obviously, Gideon, space, time, and architecture, she translated it. He spoke German. She actually translated all of his books. And she sort of became a person that worked with Sert too. She was the one, the woman behind the man sort of scene, which a lot of people thought was, you know, too bad. Um, anyway, so um, through this period, she's actually educating herself by working with these famous people. She also then got involved with Doxiadis, who had his own kind of theory about um, the world uh, and planning. And he became another one. And uh, she, she actually was, as you mentioned, Rahul, she, she edited Akistics, uh, the magazine then. And, um, but then she actually was facing barriers, as was quite clear. First of all, she, she lacked a kind of a, an authentic education in any of these fields. She was learning by being with all these people, helping them write the books, and so on and so on. And um, so she was really self-trained. Uh, she was a woman in a man's field. That's why I started with my story in Cape Town. And, um, but she found a way. And um, when she, when one day she was talking to Gideon, and she said to him, one has to be better at some aspect of parts of this we're all doing together. Men don't resent people who superiority for being uh, really good at routine things, uh, being efficient, and so on. And so she decided that that was going to be her role. She was the person who helped them write the books, get them published, translate the stuff. You know, she knew how to do it. She's apparently incredibly fast, and um, you know, and, and compiling information. So, um, but you know, so she, she. This is the way she educated herself. This is the way she got to know everybody. Apparently, she had an incredible energy. People talked about it, and she was obviously a social creature, and. Um, and then Jersey Sultan, who I actually studied with too, um, he, he, he said she was the greatest erudite in three different disciplines, architecture, landscape, and planning, and could meld them all together into kind of a seamless whole. And this is the Jackie that I met, of course, when I arrived. Oh, I need some water, by the way, guys. I'm getting, could you please? Thank you. Thank you. And then Bill Doble, who also taught me, I said the same, much the same time. Um, she had enormous energy. Her most striking quality was how she was unselfishly helping to develop ideas of others. And basically, they wouldn't have written the books they did if it wasn't for her actually working with them very diligently behind all the scenes. So um, this is a kind of an interesting person who actually you know, arrives at Hobbit, and she's also the only woman there teaching, you know. She was thrilled to have another woman student, actually, and, uh, and so on. So that's, that's where she, where she that was her background. Um, she died 40 years ago, by the way, one week later than this week. Wow. And um, she didn't stay at Hobbit very long. She was there, as you said, from 55 to 69. She then retired in Greece. And um, I visited her though once. It was just a wonderful place. I had to sleep in a hammock, you know, because everybody had occupied the floors and the futons because she was so searchable. There were always people coming through. And, um, and then, uh, so I went through this year uh, with her. And um, let me just get these slides going. Which one was it, Mr. Let's see, was it a red one? Or was it, no, it was a. Which one was the, the next? Did I press this one? Just the green. The big green one. Yeah. Okay. Small, oh, here we go. So there's Jackie. Actually, quite a beautiful woman. And there she's with Nehru because she actually had things she was doing in India. And she wrote, actually, after after um, um, the death of Patrick Geddes, there was another book to come out, and it's called um, uh, Geddes in India. And it was an, apparently a wonderful book that she actually edited uh, with his son. And that came out. And when she was in India this time, she actually met Doxiadis. And they started communicating with each other. So she had all these kind of fascinating characters she was inter inter interrupting, interacting with, uh, kind of in this sort of seamless fashion. 
And then Chad, of course, is the next one I'm going to show you. And there he is. And you know, I was so spoiled. This was a conference in Royama of, of Team 10. And I went there. You can see there's Alison Smithson, and I'm the one, the third one in the, in the background. So I, you know, I arrived at a very hot time, I have to say, and had three completely amazing years, because a lot of the people from the Bauhaus were floating through. Serge Shemayev, you know, he was always walking through the school, and, and, uh, and so on and so on. So it was, it was a really very hot time to be dealing with urbanism, because it was everywhere. Everybody was talking about it. So after this, what do you do? Let's see. My, oh, there we go. So I go to Expo in 67, and so does another colleague of mine, Jerry Miller. And um, somebody was going through the archives one day and found all these drawings of mine. And we came up with all sorts of wild and wonderful ideas, and none of which had got built, of course, because we were two way out. And um, after the Expo, Stupid things. This, what, is, what it's basically saying is, um, who on earth is this woman? C could you guess what she does? And people thought, well, it's a model, it's an artist, it's this or that. But 300 answers later, yes, I'm actually one of the architects for the expo. It's so ridiculous. Anyway, um, all right, so now we move on. And I go back to Cape Town. I promised my father that I, that I would go back, and we were going to build a house for him. And um, and that was the first job I did. And then later, I actually met Tony Santos when I was there briefly. Uh, we got married, and later we returned uh, to Cape Town again and continued a career together. But here, some of you may recognize this. So this is what I decided was my first house. You know, I, I knew how to think big. I didn't know how to think small. I had no clue what to do. I never detailed everything. I'd never done working drawings. So this is the house of an urban designer for sure. And this was the kind of, um, this is Aldo and I who like to talk in riddles all the time. And a tree is a leaf and a leaf is a tree, a house is a city and a city is a house. So I go, oh wow, what a good idea. Let me see if I can make some sense of this. And which, which I then proceeded to do. And here it is. And this house, um, let me see. You can see here. Uh, this is for my parents. And they wanted three bedrooms and bathroom suites. They had a maid who's in South Africa, another suite here. Uh, they had this very strange lot. And oh, yes, that's right, of course. Um, I'd been looking a lot at the whole issue of housing and privacy and community and all this sort of stuff it all came out of this same period of people. And so um, I started with the house and a house, all, all the bedrooms. And they separated from each other. And they actually on different levels. And you can see the way you get into them. You can never see the doors. And then this is the way you get into the house, a long, long passageway from the public domain to the private. This is a ramp. And the whole house has ramps. They've got no stairs. And they all in blue brick. And even the, the kind of a service ramp here. And in the middle of the space was the dining, living room, kitchen. And now what is very important is that actually you can begin to see how it's rising out of the ground. And then a lot of it had to do with indoor, outdoor. My, my parents loved having the garden, and so every room has its garden. And then this is the ramp of a stair that goes up. And actually, you go all the way through to the other side, and then you can all look all the way back. But this is sort of the going from the public to the private zone, which um, I could decided was an extremely important idea. This is very important. You learn this from Japanese gardens, you know. They didn't have a big enough property. So one idea was, why don't we borrow the neighbors? And so what I did was I sunk the garage, as you can tell here, um, into the, and we built a whole garden on top of it. And these are the neighbors' trees. So they're, they're, and there it is. So it's, the property seems endless, whereas in fact, it's actually quite small. And that's the, the street that goes all the way through into the garden at the other side. So I'm separating out the different functions very deliberately. And then you can see, this is actually what the corridor then is, because Rick ramped away. But it also has a series of alcoves. And they had a paint collection. And that's where they, they had a gallery. And each bedroom has its own terrace. And it, when you're in these bedrooms, you can't tell that you in, I, anyone else is around, because they just it's an individual little house. And then my dad had a blue chair, and uh, which you can see here. 
and I made this funny little window because he could sit next to the fire and see a, a really a very beautiful garden in a, a tree in the garden. All right, so that was the first building, and then the neighbour actually close by loved it. Also won various awards, and so I was sort of on the map as a, as a young architect to be. And this woman had this garden, and it was um, filled with incredible specimen trees. She had five kids, and she wanted five houses as a present to give them somewhere in their lives. And so we were committed to actually keeping, keeping all the trees. And this is actually, this really is a theme and variation, because you can see the five splayed lots um, all had gardens on the roofs, and, gardens, and we had ramps actually going all the way from the gardens on the ground to the gardens on the roof. And the owner could view the new housing, which all built as if it's a landscape. And theme and variation. By the way, this is sort of the mapping I do with every project, by the way, which is the whole idea about the maps. Um, so we started with a theme and variation. So here you can see this is the typical house that actually had a path going through it. These were the bedrooms like in the other house. The living room, dining room, kitchen was in the middle. And uh, then a wonderful garden. And then ramps taking you up. Uh, to the roof. And these were the trees we decided to keep. We had to, actually. We just were committed to doing this. It was an enormous tree, beautiful. And then there were some, like these ones, for example, set up a diagonal in the, in the garden, which was then repeated inside the house. And then this last one actually had a grove of trees that we built around. And so the theme and variation gets itself played out. And here it is. Pretty wild, actually. Um, but it's a wonderful, wonderful, it's still quite, quite contemporary in feeling. People have added on to it. And then, and this is where you can see the trees are actually intertwined, and the house at the end, of course, which is special because it had the trees in the middle. And although they died, uh, they've been replaced. I'm talking about this one here. And then the street. Uh, all, all of the houses are very private. Each entry is slightly different. It has um, light above the door. I wonder if there's a slide of that. Let me see how I got it. No, and then on the garden side, it opens up. And we had as few walls as possible between the houses. So they're very private to each other. Oh, yes, this is the whole motif of how you could get the, the light on the door, pivot doors. Um, and each house then had a different kind of way in. So we, the theme and variation, honestly, where we could vary it, we, we continue to do so. And these are the bedrooms, all opened up, sliding doors to their own gardens. These are the roofs, which we planted. And this last house was pretty special, actually. And here you get a sense of how this is the steps, of course, going up onto the roof and around what then becomes this, this uh, patio in the middle, the courtyard. OK, I'm going to show you just one more house, and then we'll get into bigger things. Um, this, this house was pretty famous, actually. The guy was going to, going to build it himself. And um, he had another one of these funny panhandled lots. And this is, these are the diagrams, some of them anyway. The whole idea of where the views were, they had a river on the one side, very important. There's a little spiral stair there, very important, because he wanted the kids to be able to be autonomous. When they get upstairs, um, you can see this is the kids' wing. They can actually see out of there, and they all have little doors onto this walkway, and they could go down and be independent. And this is where the transition is to the parents. You see it unfolding. All right. By the way, he kept on adding to the garden. It's, it's truly amazing, this place. And uh, very important to actually take the roof up so we could ventilate through the, the, the loggia. And then we had light coming in, of course, as you can tell from the top here. Um, and then here we were able to have an outdoor sitting area. That's the kids. And you can begin to see how it begins to fl flirt with the outside and actually begin to, its profile then begins to match the profile of the mountains. And then my mother actually, when my father died, really didn't want to live in that big house anymore. And so she said, gosh, I wonder we could do a, have a, an apartment that feels like a house in the sky, you know, for a South African family. What does that mean? Well, it's pretty ridiculous, but it um, means two entrances. People's maids might stay there. Um, and she's a gardener, she loved her garden. And so the idea of making this big kind of brief soleil, uh, which was a hanging garden um, uh, and a sun shading device. And this is really the case, that we actually, 
made gardens on the ground level, then gardens on the upper level, and then this loggia becomes the, um, the piece that shades it. And then we had two stair systems, by the way, a, um, a scissor stair. So there were two stairs that were intertwined. One was a service stair, and the other one was a main stair. And uh, so they actually, the service people could go to the kitchen, and also on that stair reach to where they, they lived, since they had rooms there. And here you begin to get some sense of it. And my feeling was, you know, if you want a house in the sky, you know, you have to have a place where it's habitable that's outside, and you have to be able to dine, you know, on a patio or something. That was my definition. Here we go. And then I also got involved with low-cost housing. I was teaching in Cape Town, by the way. I've always taught and practiced simultaneously. And these were some of the kind of low-cost housing units we did. Um, Cromfle was actually outside of Cape Town. And Ratsapa was in Swaziland. And we worked with a friend there. Um, and the lower ones here. Oops, sorry. Go back. Oh, back. Yeah. Can I go back, somebody? OK, good. Um, these little houses, actually, what was very important is actually put them on the diagonal. These were the typical houses in the village. They begin to gang together, and they make streets. And there's just this little gap. You know, it's just a piece of the wall that isn't there between this house and the next one. And then you have this porch right on the edge of the street, people park cars or otherwise. And then there's a diagonal view between the dining and the kitchen area. And these houses, you know, cost $5,000. It was amazing. And they were built by the people who were going to live there. Then one reason why we went back to Cape Town was we got a big commission. Um, we had both gone to, to UPenn and got master's degrees in city planning. And there were two friends of ours who were competing for this new town in town in Johannesburg. And we were on both of the shortlists. So we knew we'd go back to South Africa, whether we liked it or not. And that's, that's where we went. And these are the kinds of drawings I was doing, because I was very interested in how you could work with landscape and building form and, and you know, deal, deal with the breeze and the sunlight and so on. For example, the top, the top diagram. You know, the, these buildings shaded, shaded the low rise from, from the breezes and so on. And this, this went on for two years, by the way. It kept us all in business, but then in the end, uh, this property was sold. It turned out to be a very lucrative investment. And the company, it was a, a mining company, sold it to someone else. But not before I did probably a lot of work on, on housing. I mean, I used, used to do these diagrams. I, you can see them here. I'd do these. Every two days, I'd come up with another one. There were at least 30 of them. And they, these were going to be tested, actually, um, uh, on the site. And then, uh, just before I was now determined to, to leave the country, I just needed to get back to America, um, we entered this competition uh, for Santiago in Chile. And it was, um, it was one of the most exciting things I ever did. There were um, 16 blocks and, um, and a highway in the middle of it. Everybody was doing a tower in the park, because that's what was their Quran. And I said, absolutely no one. Not at all. So we actually went to Chile and walked the street and came up with, um, let me just this, I can show you one more slide quickly. And this is what uh, the development we saw was that there were alternating streets. There were two, two patterns, a kind of a suburban pattern and an urban pattern crossing each other. And this was a place of intersection between the two of them. And how the question was to, to make some sense of this. Um, okay. And then we developed a whole series of prototypes. Um, the low rise, by the way, this had to be for people of all income groups. So the low rise was really aimed for the kind of lower income sector. Uh, the only elevators in the scheme were actually in, in the high rise blocks. And we were trying to kind of mix the uses together. It's interesting when I went back over the plans not so long ago. I mean, we had everything programmed in there. My God, there was casinos and markets, and you, you know. Anyway, we came third internationally in this competition, which was a big deal. And um, I actually had to present it in, in Chile a couple of years ago, actually, because there was a whole interest in this thing again. None of it was ever built, of course, including the, the winners, which were high rises in the park. Um, OK, so now I'm going to go quickly through 
my career, I come back to the States, and where do we go? We go to Rice. And there's Peter Rowe over there, who I <laughs> met at Rice. Uh, the problem was, you know, if you actually come to a new place, a new teaching position, a new city, how do you find clients? Well, you know, you just don't. And so after a while, I, I, I said, well, this is just, this is ridiculous. And so I started making these movies that um, actually Sarah t talked about. Um, and I was doing, I was actually, one of my studios was in an area of the city that was really bombed out. I mean, houses were just falling apart at the seams. And uh, I, we were so outraged by it all. And then there was a statistic that blew my mind. It was like nine out of, six out of 10 units actually that were home owned in this, these neighborhoods uh, by mostly uh, black faculty families uh, were structurally unsound. I was like, what? I mean, how can the city even publicize something like this with a straight face? And you know, we all the class and I, and so we said, oh, they better make films about it. People need to know about this. So I actually went to the Texas Committee on the Humanities, because I knew somebody there. I said, look, how about us making um, maybe a film series for public television, you know, t taking a look at this whole thing. And, uh, you know, we actually, we, we were driving through the neighborhood and we kept on saying, oh, this, is, this city's invisible. I mean, how can people know? And this whole series started and um, got the money. Um, and it was like a crazy summer driving around uh, these neighborhoods actually drinking tea on sagging porches, talking to little old ladies, etc. So watching garbage dumps. I, you know, it, it was a big adventure. And uh, sorry, go back. Oops. We'll, we'll get to this. We'll get. Ah, oh, there we go. So it was a summer, honestly, of us actually t interviewing. And I, I didn't want to be in this film, but you know, I was the person with the information. So I become the chief narrator. You know, and every day. It was amazing. Every day we'd, we'd be filming, and every evening we'd come back and have to look through the day and log it in, you know. And uh, it was the first time I actually realized I was quite good at speaking publicly because, you know, I had no inhibitions by this time. And these were some of the people, and we, we taped all of this. We had thousands and thousands of hours of tapes of people talking about the situation. And then on every, every week, we put it on five weeks running, we put it on TV, and we showed the story. And the people who were working with us were all the humanists, because this is part of the deal. And there were people from the University of Houston and Rice, et cetera, and people from the outside. So you know, every, we had a, people from the Hispanic community, from the black community. Uh, James is the one down below, who's the filmmaker, who's actually a documentary filmmaker from the Media Center. Um, and then we'd, we didn't have the equipment. It wasn't even available in those days. But people used to phone into my house. So on Monday evenings, I had my buddies come over because people would call in. And we had all these phone banks, you know. And uh, we'd film them saying, you don't think this is Houston? Oh my god, where do you come from? Oh, Chicago. Wow, Chicago. And then, you know, crazy things. And, you know, I was phoned up one morning, woken up as, are, are you a communist? You know, I mean, we were just, like, it was wild stuff. And um, so every, every, every Monday, we would take these people and we'd spend the next four days re-editing this all into the next episode. It was exhausting. And then the last one, frankly, we invited all of these people to come to the University of Houston, which is where the PBS uh, actually facilities were. And we, we had a kind of a live debate. It was, it was really incredible. And we voted on it, uh, what had gone wrong. Um, this actually was for years was so shown at um, at film festivals and things like that. And I used it as a teaching tool, actually, because there were incredible episodes. Like there was one all about the garbage dumping, you know, in neighborhoods of wild, you know, and how neighborhoods were going down and what how, and, and, and so on. Anyway, meanwhile, just to keep myself amused, I was doing this. And I had a whole clothing collection um, that I, uh, it needs a hand um, painted clothes. Uh, and it wasn't, actually in Bloomingdale's actually got, got to know some of this and introduced me to a textile mill in Brazil. And I was actually designing for, for, for Terry Verot robes, which were made in New York and they were in the Christmas catalog of Neiman Marcus. And this is a whole career I realized I could just go on and do, you know. I was having so much fun with it. And they paid me for doing this, this, this stuff, yeah.
as compared to architecture. Meanwhile, then I come back to Hobbit. This is the marriage does not survive. It was based on living and working. And I get to Harvard, where I'd actually spent many years of my life already. And, um, and I'm actually, the most important thing I do <laughs> is build my first house. So this is this one on Beach Street uh, with my friend Andrea who's over there. Uh, we bought this building together, or this floor of this building together. And it was, it was riotous, it really was. And you know, now, now I've got an interior landscape. I don't have landscapes anymore, so I have to make my own, if you will. Okay. And this is this improbable staircase. Um, probably totally illegal, right? Because it changes its pitch as it goes steeper, as it goes up towards the private areas. And, uh, you know, and then it kind of molds itself down. And it's, as you go down the stairs, it's extremely gracious. It's incredible. Uh, but one night, I, I've moved in ahead of everybody. A burglar actually gets in, a cat burglar, up at the top level, and I'm down below all of this where there's a bathroom, and suddenly the only door in the house goes, eh. I come out, my cat and I, what on earth are you doing, I say to this person. He says, how the hell do I get out of here? You know? <laughs> you know I, I said, oh, you go right out there. You know, anyway. And um, I couldn't scream because nobody hear me. I was the only person there. You know? So, um, but here it is. You can see how it, it's, it, it gets steeper as it goes up. I'm able to show films because I'm still making films. I was very interested in light, south light going into the studio up at the top and north light coming down this big window. And so, um, you know, it was probably the most fun staircase I ever did. And there it is. And this is the bathroom. Oh, this was great. I mean, Andrea was, by, by the way, building her house next door, and we were into soaking tubs. So this was mine. I, was, I said, it's like, it's like Marilyn Monroe lying on her side. You know, you just get into this thing with a glass of wine and a book, and it's a wonderful way to end the day, you know. Um, and here we go. So meanwhile, I was actually working with Anne Spoon, and we were working in landscape, and we were publishing uh, some work together. And then uh, there's a knock on the door, and it's, uh, it's you, Penn. Actually, I swear the dean picked me up. I was just crossing the street, and he's, he kind of sidles after me. I'm like, I don't have guys pick me up. What, what is this? You know, we get to the side room. He says, would you like to be interviewed to be chairman of architecture at Penn? I go, are you kidding me? And of course, I did, and I went, and I became it. OK. So. Now, I'm always starting, this is just a summary, because actually this is one of the things we did. But, you know, Penn, I, I did some pretty fantastic things at Penn. I, I, loved, I loved chairing the department. You know, I'd actually graduated in, in, in planning at the school. And um, one thing I did uh, was I actually tried to open this up to the world. I mean, they were so honestly uh, provincial. I had to have the students traveling places. I started this. A project with Doshi. We went to Ahmedabad to do uh, w workshops in summer with him on housing. It was fantastic. And then one year we couldn't do that uh, because we were, there, was, there was a kind of an emergency health wise. And then I was phoned up actually on the 1st of April, to be absolutely precise. There'd been an enormous um, earthquake in Chile, uh, in Colombia, and uh, the city. Uh, was absolutely covered in mud and people kind of were suffocated. And could I think about bringing some students? And I said, oh my lord. So I put this notice up and I said, it's not an April Fool's Day, by the way, P.S. It is April Fool's Day. But you know, I'd like students to actually volunteer to come and do this. And I, I'd say 60 people applied. It's like, okay. And then we kind of Looked at, looked at the statistics and actually realized I could take 16, two faculty as well. And we went, we went to Colombia to work on helping them figure out what kind of a new city could happen because it was a total emergency. And this was very interesting because, you know, who survived? Well, the, the, the rich people were actually living close to the downtown area, so they were all wiped out. The banks were gone and all that. The prostitutes and pimps were all up in the hills and they survived. So we had this crazy thing. They wanted to rebuild the city for the survivors who then started to sell their options to other people. So, you know, it was very, very crazy. 
Uh, so we spent uh, about four weeks, actually, literally. And I told all the students, look, you know, just put away your egos. I mean, this has to be using the building technology that exists, the prototypes that are there. But this one particular area, which we took the slide of, we were rebuilding uh, near the, the, the kind of central marketplace. And this was the, the bus station, too. And we were doing actually live work housing, but with two streets, a pedestrian street and a vehicular street. So people would have houses that had two front doors, one into their work and the other one into their houses. Uh, some of these things were built, and it was quite amazing. And we actually went, uh, went there for um, a couple of years running. So this is just the synopsis of the kinds of things I was doing. And then, in fact, uh, you alluded to some of the stuff, thanks. <laughs> uh, we had these wonderful weeks when I just stopped classes, um, one in the spring and one in the fall. And in the spring, um, we actually had many courses. So people could come for a whole week, and they would each do a good five courses. Uh, and they'd take them. And they'd be subjects adjacent to architecture. You know, It may be, honestly, related to the arts or filmmaking or something. And uh, they, they just loved it. In fact, in the end, the whole school did it, you know, because it was such, it was such a breath of fresh air. And students started to meet each other also. And then in the fall, no, it's the other way around, but don't worry, we had design week. And I actually invited five people from around the world who came and spent a week with us. Um, and uh, I picked people who actually had diametrically opposite concepts. So, and then we all had the same design problem. And then on the fourth day, the fifth day, which was a Friday, the reviews were amazing because you saw what a Sorkin's point of view would represent, or Coop Himmelblau. We had all these crazy people coming in. I had um, I had Alvaro Caesar come in. Actually, uh, Marky came in once. I um, and these were an enormous hit. And the other thing about this was people would leave saying, "Oh my God, I was you, Penn. You can't believe the stuff they're doing." Right? So it was a wonderful kind of PR maneuver on my part. Since I am, oh boy, I'm, I'm doing what I said I wasn't going to do. OK, let's hurry up. Oh, and then, of course, I built my own house. I always do this. This is another whole thing, another step place. This is what I built. Now, this is two times I actually brought the, the, the sun into the basement, which was my studio. So. And then I'm going to show you a couple of things that was a big win. This is a competition for um, an, art, an art school, um, a center for the arts in Hawaii. And this was the mountainside. Next to this big building, there's a whole piece of land there. And that was the site. Uh, this was the scheme. Um, and there was a kind of, you'll see there's a kind of a walkway that goes all the way around. And many of these were the kind of gardens they were programming. This is very important because the, the academic was um, on the mountainside and the valley was actually much more public. And these two played off each other, the landscape and uh, the contours. And then there was a bridge crossing that was very important too. So there, there was that whole loop. And we won this, by the way. That's why I'm showing it to you. And, uh, and there you can see how the breeze, breezes pass through. And then some cross sections. Oh, there were two. There was an outdoor theater and an indoor theater. And then, so actually, you can begin to see on the far side here, this is the art school, actually. And this is the theater. And this is all the public space. So guess what? Um, the day I've, I've won this, I can't believe it. It's amazing. We spent two or two, three weeks, I think, exactly. And we charretted this through in Christmas. And uh, the day I arrived in uh, Hawaii, uh, the president was fired because he didn't have enough money to build this. And, <laughs> and I thought, oh, God. And why did I do it? I was actually approached by Albright College, who wanted to interview me, but I didn't have any arts stuff in my portfolio. So um, I did this competition. And then I won it, which then allowed me to win this one. And this is the uh, Center for the Arts in Albright College. This did get built. It was also a focus of a, 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 of a, of a um, collaboration with Mary Miss, uh, the sculptor, and my engineer from 
from, from uh, Tokyo, uh, who did this, this thing. And we, we actually, there was no entrance to the campus. It was very strange. So they said, well, couldn't you make the entrance to this thing the part of the campus? And you can see the weird geometry of everything there. And so we picked the idea of a circle uh, as being the focal place. And Mary and I then were going to design this circle together. And here it is. Something odd, you know, because you can tell and as you're coming to this, this isn't an ordinary entrance. And that was really actually the whole thing we did. And you came through that circle, and there were paths re reaching all these other places that were off access, like this funny little house uh, in here. Got drawn into the conversation because of the fact that we could geometrically with that. And here it is. And they had, they've had graduations sitting around here, performances, and so on. And that's Mary actually making some kind of almost like a, th it's, it's an almost a, a timepiece actually down below. And Nori with the shade roof up above. And so the, the patterns on the floor are completely extraordinary. And then I had a, this, a, it was still the staircase thing fascinating me. I wanted a staircase that went inside and outside through a glass wall. And this was the one that actually took us through uh, to that um, amphitheater area. And that then led to the ICA. And so, um, the drawings actually here were what I presented at the interview. You know, I designed the thing in advance. I just went in. I knew they were in a, had to fast track it. So I actually kind of, in front of their eyes, I said, look, this is how we're going to go about it. And I got the job. And we, we had a very little time to actually put this together and build it um, because they had a show coming up. And they actually didn't have place to put it. So this was the building. And then this actually, I think, is a pretty fantastic window, which um, is actually moving from the ground level to the next level up. It's a ramp, so you can actually look out at the street, so people can see people coming and going, so it's not just a black box, and, um, and so on. This is a very successful building. All right. It was very flexible, too, actually. That was the most important thing. So there were different kinds of spaces. And then the last thing is kind of interesting. You know, there was a period when it was closed and um, because of the pandemic. And, uh, but they wanted it to kind of still be a presence in the city. And Na Kim, from, uh, who's a Korean artist, um, was hired actually to do this decorative stuff. So she actually made, she, she'd never went there, but she looked at my drawings that were so accurate and the models I'd made. So she actually made this whole kind of decorative, curious thing. And actually, people would come and see it itself. You know, so the museum was still active uh, through this process. And then there's the last piece about the arts, because I was asked by my um, friend of mine in Tokyo, uh, and I'm not going to get into great details. He, he wanted to have, um, I'll show you here. He, he had an artist who was going to do sort of artifacts for him. And he had a big, big, big wall inside there and also another one in the basement. And he wanted um, this landscape architect, designer, painter, to give him art that he could look at. And so this building was actually built as a place to display art. It's sitting there in Tokyo. It has a setback system, which is typical of those tiny, tiny lots. Here they are. And then the staircase, of course, is a big thing, because uh, here you could actually climb up in the building. This is the, on this side on the right here. This is. As when you come in, you, you see this, it's kind of dramatic. And uh, when you go down is the other view, this one, where people actually put little places to show their artifacts and stuff. And, um, and then this is part of this big painting that he, he made. By the way, it was ridiculous. It's, it was four seasons, but there were three levels. Like, that, come on, that doesn't make any sense to me, right? <laughs> But anyway, that's what happened. And we made an amazing uh, wall, a floor, actually, made out of granite, which was which, which actually put together in pieces. And it went from actually being black at the painting to being red at the wall. It's going back to my fabrics, by the way, PS. So um, I knew how to do that. And here's this painting again. And then that, all of that led me to yet another one of these office buildings in Tokyo, where, again, the staircase being very important in this case, it's, it's kind of um, you can see this cross section. This is the atrium, but we had a street going through, and he wanted people to be able to walk through this building, but be able to see these fantastic gardens that were going on on in the inside. Um, this one didn't get built either, alas. 
But then I wanted to, he wanted me to design his guest house, and this was on a piece of sacred land uh, that had really never been built on, and it had wonderful trees. And, and this was really kind of the big leaf that, that was the roof sheltering the family. But there was a big skylight window that went up, so you could actually, in there, you could see the trees itself. And that's a very simple plan. And then, actually, because it was Japan, and it's very easy to kind of have wall, windows that go into slots, we could open this whole thing up, so the indoor-outdoor was really, really quite, quite dramatic. Okay. That was the roof. Never leaked. Amazing. And then the detailing, to, trying to bring back the... Uh, oh, my God, I've gone really way over here. All right. We're going to rush through. The next big win was Franklin Abrea. This is housing, affordable housing in Los Angeles. And it came down to a very complicated competition against my friend Craig Hodgetts and one other architect, and we won it. Uh, it's on a very ridiculous site. It's a sloping site. And we wanted something that was more like a village than an apartment building. And this was the way we saw the breakdown of the people. We didn't want to do this for sure, so we wanted individual garages uh, where people could actually feel, feel human when they parked, and we didn't want interior corridors. And then we wanted to actually create a series of courtyards where people could um, meet each other, um, and through ventilation, absolutely typical. And these are the models. Actually, this was made for the competition too. And actually, the diagonal views through and down the slope to the city. And then trying to bring um, actually higher living rooms, actually. So you, here you can see these are one and a half high. And then off these here, you could actually have smaller units. And sometimes these could join into that. So these would be for single people, uh, elder, elderly. And very important, actually, to have this um, kitchen dining living room as a space, which looked out of the gardens on this side too. And these were actually where people could sit and have picnics and actually observe the kids playing actually down below. And we wanted them actually to look like big houses. Um, uh, in, this was in, in, in the Beverly Hills area. Lots of pushback. Didn't want the great unwashed living in their neighborhood. Here actually it was another competition we won in Los Angeles. There was this big, big uh, uh, lake, actually, which was for flood control. And uh, with Craig Hodgson and Ming Fong, we made this competition together. And our idea was to really look at the history. And the history was really um, of groves of trees. Uh, and that were, they were actually mostly citrus. And they were er 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 erased um, as people were building. And so we kind of set up this matrix of the trees. You could park under the trees and actually, um, and then, then carve out spaces. This was really kind of the, the, the lobby to go to the theater. And then a hill, which we will see coming up again. You could actually go through this mysterious hill to the other side. And here, or you could go up on ramps to the other side. And then as they, you got towards the water, we changed the the spacing of the trees, and we introduced palm trees. So you could actually hear the water. And then actually on the lake, we had um, boats that artists could design. And this is the Ramada restaurant, actually, on the, on the lake. People would go to that place in the middle, which was really for the founders. That would be there. That's where they'd be drinking, you know, and having a good time. OK. Gosh, I'm running out of time. This is bad. What is it? Uh -uh. But you guys took a long time, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to dwell on this much. Okay, University of California. All right, this is this was the best job in the world. I was asked to create a whole new school of architecture at the University of California, um, and they pursued me for reasons that are beyond me. I kept on saying, "No, no, go away," but they wouldn't. And then, um, and here it is. This was a poster done by Lorraine Wilde, who was really terrific. And I hired a new faculty. I renovated buildings. We, we created a whole new, very interesting curriculum, frankly. Uh, we started the school. 
And then we ran into the budget cuts in the California system, and bingo, suddenly we didn't have a school. And I was so pissed. And what I did with the last, the, 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 everybody had to leave except the last class that um, I was teaching. And um, I decided we'd demonstrate what, if we'd survived, what we could have done for the city. And this is the, um, this is what I produced. And we looked, at, we settled on a, a part which is called Center City East, and we went to work. Gosh, did you come to this, Peter? Yeah, yeah that's right. And we had a series of threats. So we had Peter come, we had people from all over the world, honestly, volunteered and flew in to help me uh, pull this off. And over three uh, big charrette weekends, we created this. The, the press was absolutely, you know, loving every minute of this. And on the last day, we would actually have um, show the work, and people came, and it was filmed, and uh, and, and and people could uh, tune in. And in fact, at the last one, uh, the the mayor came, and then I was invited to present it at the city council, and it was adopted actually for um, the city plan. But these are just some of the images. Everything we did was all collectively done together, and. Uh, it's pretty amazing. All right, next thing, another one I won. Okay, this is Paris, uh, Paris California. Horrible, horrible part of the world. Um, and um, I knew perfectly well that this, this was, I, this is the mat of the door of the, of the, of the so-called um, uh, Civic Center. I, oh my God, we, have, we were up against the Venturi's, I forget who, you know. And I said, I, well, we, we could, we're not going to do this, absolutely not. So, um, and it was, it was a very interesting place. It was surrounded by hills. Uh, this was the best building on, on the whole, in the whole city, actually. It was, it was all pseudo-Spanish stuff. Um, anyway, uh, so we went through a whole, this is a pretty important piece of work, actually. The, this was the landscape, it was so amazing. It was soft and it was hard and it was, it was quite magical. And we had a number of buildings we had, to, uh, we had to honor, which were these ones. And we had this piece of land. And so we created actually a kind of a circular space. And we, we'd done it before, and it worked quite well. And uh, here we go. And out of this, we started to think about time and day and, and the whole history of time. And so we, we were actually then, what we did was we created this gnomon, actually, which is a staircase which was the sundial, so we could actually, this was the way of making the clock for the time, and you could go up to the roof where they, we'd have um, a mini amphitheater, and below that was actually the, yeah, it was actually the council chamber. And then um, what I decided to do was create a series of places that were actually dealing with a different phenomena. One was actually, the first one, very importantly, was dealing with the sky. Because actually, this was famous for hot air ballooning, because there's something iridescent about the sky. And so I thought, if we could bring the sky to the ground, that would just be an amazing way to actually start the Civic Center. And then there's a disk here in the middle. And this is actually the rocks and the soil and everything else, which is quite amazing. And actually, when the wind blows, uh, this actually twirls around, and it becomes a kaleidoscope. Next one, actually, were the police. And so we decided to bring in hot air across this, this water pond and cool off the breezes. And then we also planted on the roof. So when you smelt honeysuckle or jasmine, you knew which direction the wind was coming from. And then uh, this is actually the center of the, the actually the, the jail. And we decided to make a really kind of beautiful garden and get misters and grow beautiful things. And so we won this competition. The mayor actually then lost the election. The person in charge of it, who was found having sex in the next town with prostitutes, the whole thing collapsed. I go, oh my God, this is, this is the profession I'm in. This is amazing. But um, <laughs> who would know? Then actually out of this comes Yerba Buena Gardens um, in San Francisco. And uh, they were very excited by the, this competition we just won. But of course, there was nothing uh, that was going to come out of that that was so good. Anyway, here is a whole part of, of the center of San Francisco. Uh, and we, oh, I don't have time to tell you about it, just believe me. <laughs> Go see it. <laughs> and here it is. Here it is. And this is a carousel, which is the part of the interesting story. This, 
Nobody wanted the carousel. Why? Ding, dong, da, da. It also vibrations. We spent about, oh, six months trying to figure out who was going to go where. Um, we had, um, let's go. You can begin to see this as a carousel. In, in the, actually, it was basically a children's museum, which uh, you'll see here, it's called the Zeon. And that, we had a ramp going up there so that people could, regardless, could actually be able to use it. Very handicapped conscious, the city. And, and then there's a whole interplay between that, of course, and the, uh, and the carousel. So you could be actually walking around here and you see the animals going up and down. In the gardens, actually, we had Paul Friedberg who did, did a children's garden. There was an ice rink here, you can tell in the background, and a bowling alley. It was a cafe, you could sit here and look at downtown. The ice rink it was any place actually you could skate in the little city and look, have some view at the outside. All right, but meanwhile, again, of course, I'm building myself another place. I find another warehouse. As usual, I'm making holes in things and bringing light in, and this is how we go. It has to be renovated. This is the studio. This is my living room, living and dining room. And now I'm just starting to build in Japan, and I'm getting amazing kind of apartment buildings and things to do. Um, this is an important one, actually, because I wanted, the, I wanted to see if we could have alternating units so that you could bring, have double high patios and bring sunlight deep into the spaces. And you could actually dine there. And then along the actually walkway, you'd come in through an entry space with the same kinds of qualities. And these were stacked units. Don't really ask about it too much. Uh -huh. And this was probably one of the most interesting buildings I've actually ever built. It's amazing that it actually works, but everybody has a double high studio, a double high patio. Um, and they don't just only use them for drying clothes. Ha ha, you know. Okay, we're winding ourselves towards the finale. And um, I come to MIT. I usually get up to the same nonsense, I have to build myself a house, I don't want to live in anybody else's place, and this is what I build for myself, it's just down the road. And I buy this factory, it was a bronze foundry, and uh, it, it caught on fire, and only the back part actually remained intact. Uh, this had to be made new, and, and here it is. This is where I live, this is where I work, this is a greenhouse, here I am at work late at night. Then we came with projects actually from California, so I had stuff, something to work on. Just from California. Very difficult, this is affordable housing again. Um, was it actually a pretty interesting client? But it was actually for artists, so it was the idea that they'd all be artists, and they'd be working artists, but artists defined fairly loosely. And we created a series of courtyards again. And they had mostly one and a half high studios. Uh, it's all linked together. Oh, we are really winding towards the end. <laughs> then we got projects in places like Guatemala. And I had, for, for a very small amount of money, we had to build a community center here in this very unlikely spot. And here it is. The big idea here was to make a big translucent roof and put most of the program in there. And then the, the kind of more solid buildings would actually be defining the edges of the property uh, and to make them safe. Because there's a lot of vandalism. That gives you an idea. Swimming pool. By the way, we couldn't use much glass, so there's a lot of translucent material, which is really quite beautiful. And then we kind of have this staircase going down to a kind of an amphitheater, actually in the woods which is what was in here, you can begin to see it. All right, this is you. All right, this is a, this is, this is a typical project from, Japan, from, Tokyo, from China. You know, you never know if it's gonna be built. This one was, but its use was changed. But this was the entry to this expo from the north. And, um, and this is really what I did. I created another hill that you could go through. 
you can begin to see entry through the hill. This was all planted on the roof. You could actually uh, go up on the edge of this and actually get to the top. And uh, you can see here. And then, and here it is, it's, it's built. Um, I don't know what it's used for anymore, kind of thing. But that's another whole story. And then this is one pavilion that, that did get built. Um, kind of interesting, very simple diagram, actually, basically. They were all just rectangles with a diagonal across them. But by the time you roof them, sort of amazing things take place, and it's all built out of wood. Oh, Gloucester's is where my other house is. You can, you know, you can go and see it, talk your way into going to visit me. It's beautiful. MIT. The big thing I did here was this um, housing, housing X, and uh, fantastic exhibition. And we showed um, workshops, a series of workshops. We had international visitors. It was an amazing expo. And the whole building was filled with media lab with our models. And this is the kind of neighborhoods we were, things we were showing. This went to Venice, actually. And then we, we this is another workshop we've been doing in Cape Town not quite concluded. And then this is the last thing for the last few years. Um, actually in Shenzhen, this is a really an immense project that goes from the bay down here to the mountain up at the top. And these are kind of corridors they were trying to build in Shenzhen, ecological corridors, and we were asked to do one of them. Uh, I'll come back another time and talk to you again. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we, instead of sitting down, we'll just take a couple of questions. Oh, it's fine. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think we'll take two questions and we'll take them together because we really run out of time. And I just sort of, while people are warming up to ask questions, I, you know, yeah. worrying about going to a new place and setting up <laughs> practice, you finally land up going to incredible <laughs> geographies and building many homes. So that's rather amazing. And I think I found really interesting how your buildings in explaining them, you never show the context of the city, right. but you pull the city into it, and in, right. in that the leaf and the city and the city and the leaf. So that's right, right, right. really quite quite interesting. So we have time for two questions. If there are any in the audience, comments, observations, anything, just to get a little conversation. Okay, so too much. That's the problem. And too fast, and too fast. Yes. Ah, Anne's got a question. Well, I, I'm Anne Forsyth, uh, one of the faculty here. Oh, thank you. Um, I just was really struck by, I'm over this side, I, I was really struck by your reflection on, um, on Jackie Tirrett. And I wondered, as you look back, what you think her biggest legacy is. Oh, look, I think she was a remarkable woman in a particular point in time when actually there was a lot of discussion about the changing in a notion of urbanism, what was important, you know. And she was able to kind of weave together the whole thing about Geddes himself, who was a remarkable man and actually extremely important. And all the stuff that was coming out of the modern, modern movement and, and the CM conferences and everything else. And, you know, um, but she did it so selflessly, which was the amazing thing about her. And um, you know, for that, we can really thank her, mm -hmm. absolutely. So to pick up on that and extend it, I mean, I think, uh, you described Jackie Tirrett and, uh, you know, you touched upon your positions at different universities right, and right. schools that you set up. And then finally, the last thing you did really was M at MIT to set up the Center for Advanced Urbanism. That's right. That's so right. tell us a little bit about that and maybe does it connect with stuff you learned from Jacqueline Tirrett or what was the ambition or what is the ambition of the center? Well, look, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing you can do in very few places. You can do it here, of course. You could do it at MIT, um, and you know most of the places I taught actually would, did, didn't have all the all the uh, disciplines. But I think I believe honestly that architecture uh, gets too isolated, and that there's a really kind of seamless connection between architecture, urbanism, planning, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and landscape. And uh, although we didn't have landscape, our idea was actually to to create a place which could be the intersection between um, the different disciplines. Uh, and it'd be actually, if we could get together as an interdisciplinary place, 
we could actually do some very fantastic things, which we did in the beginning. And um, but it's difficult to do and keep it up. Uh, and, you know, time, time passes. Um, I'm at the stage now suggesting we kind of rejuggle it mm -hmm. to bring the parts together, maybe together in a different kind of a way. Um, you know, architecture students at various times love to get involved with planning, and at other times they don't want to hear about it at all. You know, these things come in waves, and uh, the wave now is a bad one, you know? Um, but, I, but I think, um, you know, it's, I think, I think we don't want to be too isolated, because it is, is, is a continuum, and that was part of what Jackie was so good at doing, you see. She honestly knew how to weave all of these together, because it actually there is a continuum in there. And that's a nice tribute to end on. Thank to you. Jackie Turret right. and Adele, thank you so much for this. Right. Thank